8 Horrible Movie Plots. Hey guys, before we begin today's strange video, we'd like to speak to you about this episode's sponsor, the Amino Apps. As you guys are already aware, we've been absolutely loving the Amino Apps and the communities that they foster. If you're unfamiliar with the app, it's essentially a social media platform where you can connect with like-minded people from all across the globe. There are private and public chat rooms, quizzes, polls, and we've come to notice that's an incredible place to view and share fan art. I mean, look at all of this. We've teamed up with the Amino Apps today to bring you a bunch of communities that we love and that we feel you guys might also be interested in, handpicked by yours truly. These include, but are not limited to, the Culture Crash Amino, of course, the Animation Squad, and the Cartoon Community. You can join these groups insanely easily and get involved with the communities in no time. To take a look at each of our picks, simply click the link below. The Amino Apps have been huge supporters of our show, so please give them some love. There's a heap of awesome stuff over there for you guys to check out. Anyway guys, on with today's video. Hey guys, Culture here. Today we're going to discuss 8 horrible movie plots. More specifically, we'll look at the characters which inhabit them and their unique absurdities. You know, Culture, I actually took a film studies class at university whilst I was writing my original screenplay, entitled The Brand That Knew Too Much. Essentially, it's about a breakfast cereal which is both sentient and omniscient. Initial thoughts? Correction, today we're going to discuss Nine horrible movie plots. I'm not worried. By the end of the episode, you'll be begging to produce my film. Well, I guess stranger things have happened, Crash. Like these eight films. Number one, Attack of the Killer Tomatoes. The 1978 monster film spoof, Attack of the Killer Tomatoes, follows a specialist team who must stop an onslaught of inexplicably sentient tomatoes from killing civilians. How exactly these limbless vegetables, or our uh, fruits rather, kill people is hidden off screen. In one scene, we see a garden variety tomato corner a woman who then screams and drops out of frame. Another scene parodies Jaws, with a girl being pulled underwater, tomatoes bobbing up and down in the water around her. See, big mistake. Never make your sentient food the villain of the story. That's why I made Brandon more of a mentor figure to the protagonist in my film. Oh god. The brand's name is Brandon. I know, how perfect is that? It just came to me. If by perfect you mean mind-achingly cringy, then yeah, it's perfect. Mason Dixon, the man in charge of the fight against the tomatoes, eventually figures out that a love ballad called Puberty Love is so whiny and annoying that the tomatoes cannot stand it. The climax of the film sees the remaining residents of the small town gathered in a stadium, using puberty love over the loudspeakers to shrink and kill the tomatoes. Okay, that's pretty dumb, but the whole movie is a spoof, so isn't it kind of meant to be a horrible plot? Okay, fair point. How about this then? Number 2. Krippendorf's Tribe the 1998 comedy Krippendorf's Tribe follows James Krippendorf, played by Richard Dreyfus, a widower anthropologist who has used all of his grant money to support his three children. Since he has no new research to present at an upcoming lecture, he decides to make up a new tribe that he has discovered, the Shalmikid move. I'll give you one guess at how this gets really racist really fast. He puts on blackface and starts pretending to be a tribesman? Better. He gets his whole family to pretend to be a different tribe, films it, and then intercuts footage of actual New Guinea tribes. In fairness, this film is an adaptation of Frank Parkin's 1985 novel of the same name. But still, this movie was made in 1998. They should have known better by then. And guess who made the film? Disney. Disney! Well, technically Touchstone Pictures, but they're just a film distribution label for Disney. A particularly memorable scene sees his two sons playing out how a ritualistic circumcision procedure might be performed by Neolithic tribesmen. Just one scene? Filthy amateurs. Such a delicate topic deserves an entire subplot. But I should stop there. I mean, after all, I don't want to spoil too much of my film. Wait, how did you get from living breakfast cereal to circumcision? Oh, you're intrigued now, are you? Number three, Leprechaun, Back to the Hood. The 2003 horror comedy film Leprechaun Back to the Hood depicts a group of urban teens being hunted down by Lubden, a killer leprechaun whose gold the teens have been using to fulfill their dreams. And if you thought this was stupid, it's the sixth installment in the series, which means that someone thought the first five were so good that they needed another sequel. Warwick Davis plays the titular leprechaun who has a fist fight in the middle of the street, rips a girl's drawer off to take her golden tooth, and even smokes a bong, then impaling someone with said bong. Sheesh, sounds R-rated. Personally, I decided to keep my film family friendly by introducing a wacky talking elephant. Kids love elephants. Don't you feel like your film is a little bit all over the place? Well, that's why the poison dart frog army exists, to tie all the elements in. 
As the name of the film implies, this is actually the second time that they set the leprechaun story in the hood. So they don't even have the excuse of, there's some jokes we really just wanted to do in that setting, because they already had that chance. Not to mention Leprechaun 4 in space. <laughs> the series isn't all bad. Jennifer Aniston got her film debut in the first Leprechaun film, so we might not have had her as Rachel from Friends if not for these movies. Number 4. Mannequin. The 1987 rom-com fantasy Mannequin is about Jonathan Switcher, a passionate window dresser who falls in love with one of the mannequins he's been working on. Wow, that's kind of creepy, even for me. In fairness, the mannequin actually does come to life in the form of an ancient Egyptian girl, who, 4,500 years ago, ran away from an arranged marriage and made a wish to find her true love. Okay, yeah, that's creepier. But the mannequin, Emmy, is played by Kim Cattrall, so it's not all bad. Oh my god, I love her in Sex and the City. I am such a Samantha. James Spader also appears in the movie as the store manager and antagonist. It just shows you the kind of crap roles you need to take before you get any recognition in the movie business. Just in case you had any doubt about the quality of this film, the climax involves Jonathan's gay co-worker and friend, named Hollywood, dousing the bad guys with a fire hose. What's wrong with spraying people the fire hose as a climax? I happen to think it can be a very profound, richly layered scene in a movie. Now yeah, Crash? Is that by any chance the climax of your movie? Oh, what? D no way! I excuse me while I make some calls. There's been a change of plans. It's none of your business, Jeremy. Just do it! Oh, I'm sorry. Did you go to film school? No, yeah, keep the daffodils and chrysanthemums. We'll find a use for them somewhere else. Jeremy, I'm gonna have to stop you right there. I don't care about little Joshua spitting up on your ship for the hundredth time, all right? I understand that, Jeremy, but you can't fire a crew member with dwarfism. Can you imagine the negative press? Dwarfist? I I'm not sure. Either way, you take that throw up on the chest like the professional you are, all right? Thank you. By the way, how is he reaching your chest? Stepladder, booster seat, or, or what? What what technology are we talking here? Genius, why didn't I think of that? Anyway, Jeremy, I better go. Uh, culture is giving me the stink eye. Uh, no, it means he's glaring at me. Get your mind out of the gutter, Jeremy. Okay, bye, bye. Are you done? Bye. Number five, the human centipede. Oh God, skip this part, people. It's gonna be super gross and not fun at all. I'll try to describe this plot as delicately as possible, but just in case, I suggest you skip to this point in the video to avoid any extremely graphic imagery. Done? Good. The 2009 horror film The Human Centipede is about three tourists who get abducted by a German surgeon and sewn together to form one three-person being. The name may have given the exact means of attachment away, but essentially the surgeon connects them mouth to anus, thus forming one long digestive system. This comes with a number of medical ramifications. Oh no, I'm gonna puke. Well yeah, I mean throwing up is one already upsetting idea that becomes even worse in this context. Not to mention that the only source of food for the second and third people in the centipede is the other's... excrement. Jenny, the unfortunate last person in the centipede, suffers from septicemia due to this new diet, and Lindsay, the middle person in the centipede, is punished with the middle position for attempting to escape early on in the film. The language barrier between the German surgeon and the Japanese man at the front of the centipede only serves to make the film even more disconcerting and disorienting. Really, culture? You're gonna end a discussion about an involuntary three-person chimera by commenting on the language barrier? And I thought I was the insensitive one. My bad. Let's watch that bad taste out of our mouth with a kid's film. Number 6. Air Bud. The 1997 comedy film Air Bud follows Josh, a shy boy who finds companionship in Buddy, a runaway golden retriever that can play basketball. Wait, the kid can play basketball or, or, or the dog can? I'll let the movie poster answer that one. Oh? My god. That's amazing! Amazingly stupid, yes. Even better is the dog's previous owner, Norm Snively, an alcoholic clown who is abusive to Buddy throughout the film, resulting in Josh eventually getting custody of his basketball-playing friend. The film's tagline honestly had me laughing for way too long. He sits, he stays, he shoots, he scores. I mean, come on, it doesn't get any cheesier than that. Oh, that's pretty bad. How about this one? Most dogs drool. This dog dribbles. You should write for Disney. Or maybe his bounce is worse than his bite. I bow to the master of crappy one-liners. Eat my shorts. Okay, shut up and watch this clip of Buddy shooting a basket, which makes me happy that this talent exists and angry that this film got made. Number seven, The Thing with Two Heads. 
The 1972 science fiction film, The Thing with Two Heads, tells the story of Dr. Maxwell Kirshner, a doctor who has figured out how to successfully transplant a head onto another person's body. This discovery comes just in time, as Kirshner is about to die and requires a body donor so that he can transplant his own head onto the new body and live on. He then plans to remove the original person's head, giving him full control of the body as he has previously achieved with a gorilla test subject. But a complication arises when the only body donor that they can get is a black prison inmate, a huge issue for the racist Dr. Kirshner. That's right, they decided to bring race into their sci-fi film. How far through the plot are we by now? Like, end of Act 1? Uh, what do you mean? Well, the end of Act 1 would be the turning point in the story. Uh, for example, in my film, the first turning point comes when Brandon agrees to help Matthew find a date for the school dance. What genre even is your film? I guess you could call it a rom-com with action-adventure elements. Of course, the subplot is thriller, fantasy, or maybe horror, depending on how much you like clowns. Crash, burn your script. For the love of all that is good and holy, burn it. The Thing with Two Heads takes a pretty soft approach on the bigotry aspect, except that they keep calling black people soul brothers. And in case you weren't already completely turned off this film, they also have a chase scene where the interracial two-headed patchwork creature flees from cop cars on a dirt bike. Boring! Come on, culture, really just give me the worst plot you can with this last one. Challenge accepted. Number 8. Hell Comes to Frogtown. The 1988 cult disaster film, Hell Comes to Frogtown, depicts a post-apocalyptic world in which only a few fertile men and women remain. The protagonist Sam Hell, one of these fertile men, wanders the world impregnating women. My man, what a playboy! He is eventually trapped by a group of warrior women who have lost their fertile members to a group of evil mutated frogs. These frogs reside in a mutant city known as Frogtown. Okay, that's pretty stupid. Oh, I'm not done yet. They decide to take some of Hell's sample, and then force him to help them rescue their fertile women. They attach a cod piece to hell that can electrocute him if he disobeys orders or strays too far. If necessary, they can even blow the cod piece up. This is just ridiculous. Still not done. The climax of the movie sees Spangle, one of the accompanying warrior women, dancing for a frog commander called Bull in an erotic manner. This arouses Bull's three snakes, as he affectionately refers to them, and he insists on mating with Spangle. Hell bursts in just in time to save Spangle, yelling, Eat lead, froggies, before he sprays machine gun fire, taking out the mutant frog soldiers. Are you done? Also, Sam Hell is played by pro wrestler Rowdy Ruddy Piper. Okay, now I'm done. Okay, cool. Now, can we sit down and go over my script? There's just a few details that need ironing out. Crash, I know we've just been over some horrible, truly god-awful movie plots, and I hope someday a film joins them on the silver screen, but I guarantee it won't get there with any assistance from me. Fine, I'll just steal your credit card while you're asleep as usual. Wait, what? See you next week, everyone! If you enjoy what we do here at Culture Crash, please consider supporting the show via our Patreon, where we have a bunch of awesome rewards, or by checking out our online store. All links are in the description below. Follow Culture Crash on social media!